transition today into a Christmas series. Last week I mentioned to you that uh, what I had said to you last week was a segue, was a step into the Christmas season. And in some ways what I said last week was part one to what I want to say today. Or another way, it was groundwork to where we need to stay. You notice that we're still in Genesis 3 because I want to take some time through this Christmas season to look at some Old Testament texts that began to give a glimmer of hope of what ultimately becomes our Christmas. And we begin to see the very first promise of Christmas is found in the book of Genesis. Right from the beginning of the beginning, Christmas was announced. It was read to you this morning. You probably missed it. So we're going to slow down through the text and we're going to see exactly what it says. To give you some context, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, if you were here last week especially, or if you know the book of Genesis at all, but for those of you who might be just joining us, let me explain. Genesis 3.6 is the saddest, lowest point in all of human history, the lowest point in Scripture. That Eve has been given a command as the mother of all humanity, has been given a command by God who created all things and who sets the rules not to partake of a particular tree. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So the single command that God gave plunged the human race into what we call theologically the fall of man, capital F. That's not a season of the year. That is a particular state, a spiritual state in which we are in. We were created to be, as God had said, very good. We were in a spiritual state of communion with God. But something happened in the garden, as we read in first, uh, Genesis 3, verse 6, that changed the entire dynamic of all of creation and everything that came after that moment, including your birth, including my birth, has been tainted and touched by this, quote-unquote, this fall. In fact, it's come to the point, Genesis, or excuse me, Romans 5.12, I read this last week as well, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, death spread to all men because all sinned. You ever wondered why we have death? It is because of sin. What is it in us that causes our internal clock to run down? Why is it that the body can heal itself when we get a cut, we bump our head, we have a bruise, it heals. Why is it that the body can somehow regenerate in all these areas, but there's still something in us that's running down? Why do you die? Because your parents died. Why did your parents die? Because their parents died. Why did their parents die? Because their parents died. It's epidemic. Where did this come from? The scripture tells us that it comes from the fact that this is not a part of creation. We were never made to experience death. We were not meant to, meant to know this thing called death. It is part of the spiritual fall that we all experience. In fact, it is so deep that in Matthew 7, 11, Jesus drops this bombshell of a description of the human race. This context is about prayer. Just to give you some idea, you know the text God says, or Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you, seek you will find, knock, the door will be opened. Do you know that, that famous phrase? This is the context. Then Jesus says this in verse 11 of Matthew 7. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Did you catch that little uh, jibe? If you then, who are what? Jesus called everybody in the human race evil. Well, that's harsh. That's really harsh. If you then, who are evil, what kind of an insult is this? No, no. You would say to yourself, I, I'm, not, I'm not evil. Well, well, why not? Who told you you weren't evil? Well, I don't feel evil. Well, clearly then, therefore, you're not evil. If you don't feel evil, it's all about you, isn't it? What is the standard by which we measure the fall of the human race? Is it the standard that you create? Is it you measuring yourself against your neighbor? Is it you holding yourself up to some human level of standard? What is the standard? In comparison to God, this is the standard. Jesus says, 
you, the human race, who are evil, and guess what he says? Who you know how to get good gifts. So you, it's not that you're incapable of doing good. That's not what it means when the, the Bible says that we are, to use the word, evil in the sight of God. It doesn't mean that all we ever do is constantly, 100% of the time, sin to the farthest depths of sin, that we are just spewing out all measures of wickedness. That's not what we mean. Do you have the ability to do something good? Sure. You know how to take care of your children. You know what it is to look after people. You know how to make soup for somebody who is a shut-in and needs some help. Sure, you can do good. You're missing the point. The good that you do does not erase the fact that you are labeled spiritually as evil. That even the good we do is tainted by our own wickedness. Even the good that we do is tainted somehow by the very fact that at our core, there is a deep-seated problem with the human race. Anecdotally, there is no argument about this. Anecdotally, it is so self-evident. Have you ever wondered why you get those emails that wants to you to put in your bank account number and your personal information and send them off to somebody who's going to help you get rich? What's that about? Where does that come from? Why do people do that? Why are they trying to scam you? Who is it that sat them down and said, here's a way you can rip people off? You say, oh, no, no, those people are doing that because they're just poor. They're desperate. Really, is that all it is? It's a lack of education. It's that they're poor and desperate. No, I say to you, we are evil. We are looking for ways to take advantage of other people. It is not about the economic status. There are people in prison who are millionaires because they invented a Ponzi scheme to make more millions. They didn't need the money. They did it because they found an opportunity. There is something wrong with us as a species that we look for ways to take advantage of somebody else for our own benefit. Have you ever noticed when there's an earthquake or a hurricane or some sort of a natural disaster, what What's the first thing that happens to the prices that you find when you go to the store to buy a generator, a, a, a jug of milk, whatever that cannot be regulated, suddenly it is three times the price. Why? Well, isn't that interesting? The moment there's a need that's a real need, we put it to them. I can take an advantage. Where does this come from? Why is it that, uh, that airlines, for example, can charge one person 99 cents, sorry, $99 for one seat, and you're sitting right next to them for $1,200? Where is the common sense in this? I'm just asking you, what is it about the human race that makes us think this is normal behavior? We are demented. We are looking to take advantage of each other. Antidotally, there is no end to reasons to express that there is something wrong with us. Have you ever noticed what we look at for entertainment? Have you ever thought about what the human race turns on and describes as entertainment? What do we use to entertain ourselves? What is the major subject matter in our entertainment? Murder? mayhem, all measure of violence, gunfights. If there isn't in there, it's a boring story. I don't want to watch this. What is wrong with us that we drift to that as entertainment? Is this, am I the only person that finds this odd? That is what the human race thinks is fun to watch. Halloween comes around. What are we doing? What is the matter that at the core of the human spirit, we think it is fun to celebrate death. Is it me? Or are we demented as a species? We are the only race that is at war with each other. Dolphins don't fight. Goldfish don't fight. What is the matter that there is never peace on this planet? Why is it that there is something fundamentally elusive to us in being able to just get along. Why have we never got along with everyone? What is wrong with the human race? Anecdotally, you could go on and on and on. The evidence is overwhelming. There is something wrong with us. 
We all think it's everybody else out there. We put locks on our doors. We're careful where we go at night because it's all those people out there. And that is part of the delusion of your own sin that we can't by nature even recognize or acknowledge that we too are a part of the evil of the fallen race. So far, so separated from God that there is no hope that we are spiritually blind, dead, deaf, stupid, and we have no clue. No clue. This is why in Genesis 3, there comes to us the most glorious, the very first promise of Scripture is a coming day called Christmas. The very first promise to us in Scripture is because of the deepest need of the human race. I'm going to talk over this month of December in four ways. I'm going to tell you about the promise. I'm going to tell you about the prophet. I'm going to tell you about the presence. And on our last Sunday, we'll talk about the peace. This morning, I just want to point out to you the first promise of Scripture is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Let's take a run at it. Verse 14, the Lord said to the serpent, we talked about this last week, obviously it's an odd expression to find that there's a measure of a talking serpent, what is going on here. We mentioned this last week. This is the evil one himself, Revelation 12, verse 9. Give us this description. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him somehow. We don't know the timing of this, but there was an angel that God created in his presence that the Bible has given the name Lucifer. The Bible tells us that a third of the angels came and fell with him, that he created as a fallen angel his own rebellion against God. This was the birth of evil. Evil did not come from God. Evil is a deprivation of all that is good. It was birthed in the heart of this enemy, the evil one that we call Satan, the devil, whatever, the enemy of your soul. There's a hundred names for him, the deceiver, the, 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 on and on it goes through scripture. We looked at some last week. So here he comes to Eve and Adam in the garden and with this deceptive appearance of something natural to their world. The serpent has been having this conversation and caused Eve to take this fruit. The Lord God speaks now back to the serpent and as a representative of evil. Because you've done this, verse 14, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. This is a strange thing to be doing to talking to if we're assuming it's a snake or whatever you want to put in there, whatever serpent it is. Cursed are you above all livestock. He's talking to an animal. He's cursing it. What's going on here? All livestock, you might remember when we looked at the creation week, this is a broad brush term for domesticated animals. This would be, um, you know, your sheep, goats, cows, horses, whatever you want to say, are domesticated animals that we domesticate. All of your livestock, and above all beasts of the field, that's wild animals. All the categories of all the animals, above all of them, they experience the curse in the sense that they will still die. They will know the curse, but you are going to be cursed above them. You are going to be cursed in a way that is different than them. I am going to put a curse that is on you, only on you. And he's doing this to a snake or to a serpent. Now, you've got to understand that what is going on here is that this serpent, this animal, is, becomes representative of the, what he's talking about to Satan himself. Cursed are you above all livestock. He continues on. On your belly you shall go. Satan is now being debased to the lowest place. Now, not that we can get into the mind of the evil one here, but we're maybe presuming too much when we talk like this. But he probably believed in this moment that he had finally won the day and got the upper hand. He had rebelled against God. He had declared his five I wills that we read in Ezekiel 14. 
and he decided that he was going to be higher than God. I am going to take over everything. He watched God make this perfect creation, and he makes his way into the garden in a subtle disguise. He comes in and sneaks in, and now he has captured the human race. And all of creation has fallen. And the moment before he can even begin to celebrate with glee, that, aha, I have triumphed over the great and glorious God. I have captured all of his creation. I caused it to rule and follow me. They are now mine. And you can almost hear his little maniacal laugh, his glee, his rubbing his hands. I mean, we, I'm just, clearly this is conjecture. Clearly. But before any of that can happen, God pronounces on the serpent, who is now representative of Satan himself, that you are not going to triumph in this day. This is not your day to be glorifying yourself here. You are going to have a curse on you that is bigger than the curse of the animals that just simply go through the natural curse and die. No, there is something special for you. And you are going to be so low in comparison to me. You think you've triumphed? It'll be as if you are going on your belly. You are going to be down in the depths. I am still the sovereign God. You didn't win this, is what he's saying. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust. This is a Hebrew expression for the lowest of the low. Total, absolute defeat. We even use this in English sometimes, don't we? When we're trying to show up something, we say, eat my dust. What do we mean by that? Ha, ha, ha. Well, that's the same idea here. In fact, uh, Psalm 72, verse 9. May tribes, may desert tribes bow before him, and his enemies lick the dust. This doesn't mean literally, physically ingesting dust. This is just the notion that you are going to be so low that that is all you're going to get for food, in a sense. You are going to be beneath, beneath. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that the serpent or anything on its belly became a detestable food in uh, dietary laws of the Jewish people. Leviticus 11.42, whatever goes on its belly... Whatever goes on all fours, whatever as many feet, any swarm, anything swarms underground, whatever goes on its belly, you shall not eat, for they are detestable. It remained a representation of all that was evil. It wasn't anything wrong, physically wrong. You weren't going to die. We're going to, you know, we know now eating a reptile, it's got meat on it. Go eat crocodiles, all kinds of things. Why was this a dietary law? It was representation of all of the curse that went on Satan. We are physically now going to act out as a Jewish people that we're not even going to eat the thing that's on the ground. We're going to leave it there because this was part of the curse. And this is what happened for the evil one all the days of your life. This will not end. He did not triumph in the garden is what God is saying. You are not getting the upper hand. You have not won the day. You have not captured humanity. Oh, no, no, no. There is something that is going to happen that will turn the tables. You didn't win. In fact, this is uh, so expressive all the days of your life that even when you read in Isaiah 65, verses 24 and 25, which is a text that we often take to be, if you are of this ilk, of course, we have some measure of... Um, of um, argument, if that's the word to say, politely meant argument, in regards to whether this is the millennial kingdom. I would take this to be Isaiah 65, is a reference to a yet future kingdom where Christ will rule and reign on earth. And part of that description of the uh, uh, millennial kingdom says this, before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will graze together. So we know this is not present day. Wolf and the lamb are enemies. And now here they are grazing together. The lion shall eat straw. He's not chasing after the zebra. He's not looking to take down something else to eat it. He's eating straw like the ox. And the dust and dust shall be the serpent's food. All the days of your life that remains. The curse stays on the serpent even into the millennium. That whatever this new kingdom looks like, this curse lasts on the evil one right to the end of all times. It never ends. God always 
has the upper hand. And so we come to verse 15, this glorious little verse that is one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. The verse that hints to us, glimpses to us, the day we'll call Christmas. Let me read it to you. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. What does that have to do with Christmas, people? Everything. Let me explain it to you. This verse has been called the Proto-Evangelium. I'm only telling you that because it's nice to learn theological terms. When I say them to you, I sound smart. When you learn them, you feel smart. It's kind of a win-win thing going on here. This verse has been called the Proto-Evangelium. I don't make up these words. I'm just telling you what it is. Um, proto is the uh, word that means first. We use this in English when we say the proto type of something, the first of its kind. And evangelium is uh, simply a word that means good news. It is the first proclamation of the gospel in the Old Testament. Genesis 3.15, the first proclamation of good news of salvation. Let me explain it to you. I will put enmity. Enmity, now he's speaking to a serpent. And now there seems to be a shift here. I will put enmity between you, he's been talking to a serpent, and the woman. Clearly there has to be a shift in who he's speaking to or what he's speaking of. Because enmity does not exist between human beings and animals. I mean, animals may not like you. You may meet a dog that's not particularly friendly. But it isn't because there's enmity. Enmity is an emotional Response that causes someone to be an enemy. There is a moral, responsible reaction that chooses to hate. So clearly, this is not him talking about the serpent. When he says, you now, enmity, this animosity, this is between him, the you, and the woman has to be between Satan himself. I will put at hostility. Right now, she's your friend. Right now, you have just won her over. Right now, the whole human race is under your control. Right now, you have the victory in this moment. But here's what's going to happen. I am going to actually make the woman and you hostile to each other. Now, if the you is represented of Satan, then who is the woman? It clearly, in this text, represents Eve. But there is a hint here that something is going to radically transform the situation. Something is going to change to bring this about. This is the first promise of the Bible. I will. This is God's promise. I will cause the human race or some measure of the human race, as we see from the word offspring in a few minutes, that there is going to be hostility between the human race and the evil one. The only way that that can happen, we see just a glimmer of this, and only with New Testament eyes do we see back and see that this is all too inferred in the text, clearly inferred. You'd never read this. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. This is God talking. This is the only way that there could ever be enmity, that there could ever be hostility between a human heart and the evil one. That human heart has to be transformed. That human heart has to be changed. That human heart has to be brought out and given a brand new heart. And God said himself he would do this. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. Jesus called this the new birth. In the New Testament, it's described as being born again. This is the whole revolution that takes place within the heart of a person who has been transformed by God that now causes them to recognize that there is an enemy, that I have to that enemy. This was not going to happen on its own. This was not going to be a natural occurrence. I will put enmity between the wo you and the woman and between your offspring. Now clearly, this is not the offspring of, physical offspring of Satan. He has no physical offspring. Between your offspring and her offspring. 
this is talking about. The human race is what it's talking about. Between those who follow after Satan and those who follow after God. I, I, I don't know if you have a little footnote in your Bible or maybe even a translation that has the word seed there. Between your seed and her seed. That's actually what the literal Hebrew is. And that's a legitimate translation. Interestingly enough, the English... Uh, um, English Standard Version, the translators have chosen to, to substitute the word seed for the word offspring because that is the idea of the word. The idea of using the word seed is the idea of an offspring. And one of the reasons that they choose to use the word offspring is because women, without getting into too much biology here, without making this awkwardly embarrassing, women do not have seed. The seed is in the man. So why is it that the text says, between, literally says, between your seed and her seed? She doesn't have seed, unless, of course, that seed was implanted, perhaps, by something other than natural means. As we see in Isaiah 7, 41, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So here we have in Genesis 3 a very subtle hint of how this revolution, this hostility is going to take place. I promise that I will cause a hostility between some of the human race and evil. I am the one who's going to turn the tables and it's going to happen between those who follow Satan and the seed of the woman. The woman doesn't have a seed. Leave that to me, God says. I'll make sure she does have a seed. And the woman will give birth to a son. In fact, this is now the language shifts. And it actually has a personal masculine pronoun. Who is the he? Duh. Between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Interesting concept, this whole idea of bruising. It's a challenging text because the word bruise is, is properly translated here. can also mean, on what level is the bruise? can also mean to be a sincere bruising, like a crushing, a destroying. And so it's often seen and read that this text can be read Although the word is used both times, it's read that he shall bruise your, your, he shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And that's possibly what this is saying. But either way, we understand where this is going. In fact, um, one of the translations is a challenging to know exactly how this should read because bruise and crush is the same word. But there's um. um one of the translations that was actually created, um, the easy-to-read version, not that you need the details on this, it was created for people with uh, hearing disabilities who had only learned sign language, and so their language is limited, uh, their, their English scope is limited to what they know for signs. So they created a Bible and translated a Bible for deaf people to read, and this is the way that translation reads this text. I will make you and the woman enemies to each other, and your children and her children will be enemies. He will bite your child's foot, and he will crush your head. I think that's really the essence of what we're talking about. One is an attack from behind. One is a clear-on attack, a deadly attack that crushes your head. One is just a little bruising of the heel. One is something that's caused a little bit of discomfort. One is something that's caused a little pain. One is something that will heal, and the other one is absolute destruction. What are we talking about in this? What is this bruising? What is this crushing? Isaiah 53, 5. But he, the Messiah, the one who was born of a virgin, the one who was presented in Genesis 3, 15, the he, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. This is the day his heel was bruised. On one sense, yes, he was crushed. Yes, he died. Did he stay dead? How many hours in great 
scheme of things did this take place and did, did this transpire. This was but a moment that Christ himself was crushed. This was the day the enemy came and crushed the, the, the Son of God for our purposes, for our justification. This was the day that the evil one thought he had victory. And it was just a bite on the heel. Because at the end of it all, when he rose from the dead, it sealed the fate of God's ultimate enemy. His head will be crushed. Death has died. Sin has been paid for. All that took place in the garden will eventually, ultimately be wiped out. Everything is going to be made new. The wrath of God has been justified. The payment for man has been made. Everything that needed to happen, happened. And the enemy's victory was once and for all put to an end. Crushed. And his head, as it were, was crushed. By the way, we get this hint of this redemption later on in Genesis 3 as well. Genesis 3 verse 21. As they recognize that they have come to recognize their nakedness before God and their need to be covered. They've found fig leaves. Verse 21 tells us, The Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Now that, we think, is literally what happened, but there's also a spiritual truth in there. Who provided the covering for Adam and Eve? God did. Who provides the covering for us before a holy God? God does. Who was it that slayed the animal for Adam and Eve? God did. Who was it that put the ra his wrath on Christ on the cross and ultimately he suffered that death? Who did that? God did. Whose blood was spilled for Adam and Eve for this animal to cover them? It was an innocent animal. Who was it on the cross that died for us? It was the innocent Son of God. It is the covering of our sin that God provided for this. And God stepped in and did this. All of this is hinted. All of this is packed away. All of this is hiding at the very beginning. Christmas is not a surprise. It did not come as a big giant, oh, look what happened now. We knew from the very start, from the Proto-Evangelium, the promise, the first promise of God, I am going to turn the tables on the evil one. I am going to bring a race of people who are going to love me and worship me and serve me and be hostile to the evil one. I am going to give victory over sin and death and all the degradation that evil and wickedness has brought upon this land and all that the fall has, has corrupted the human race. I am going to turn that around. And in that day, there will be an absolute people who love me and serve me, that the enemy will be crushed. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is Christmas, people. Genesis 3.15. This is the first glimpse we have what is going to take place in a manger for us? This is the promise.